So it's a pleasure for me to be here and to speak to you about this topic. Um, I'm going to be uh, dividing the presentation basically in three parts. Um, so basically, first I want to kind of put nuclear weapons into context, uh, what I call the proper context. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the nuclear difference. That's the second part. And then the last part is really talking about nuclear weapons. And I'll, I think I'll end it there. And then uh, Gustavo Molino, uh, Mr. Molino will, will take over. All right, so um, putting things into context, what do I mean by that? Um, just one moment, please. This was the uh, minutes to dooms, minutes to mid, minutes to midnight for the um, the president of the bulletin announcing the hands of the doomsday clock, um, and so this is kind of a measure of you can see that over time here the 50s, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and so on, uh, kind of a measure of how close we are to nuclear doomsday, um, with respect to really twin catastrophes, one that's happening now, which is climate change, and the other one which we worry about, which may occur. Uh, if we don't stop it, which is further nuclear weapon use. Um, and we focus on nuclear weapon concerns sometimes, but the two are even sometimes intertwined. Inside the two minute war, the two minutes is no more urgent than the preceding period. Citizens around the world should rightfully echo the world, the words of climate activist Greta Thunberg and ask, how dare you? With this in mind, I'd like to now ask Jerry Brown, Mary Robinson, and Ban Ki-moon to approach the clock to reveal the 2020 time. Today, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists moves the hands of the doomsday clock. It is 100 seconds to midnight. So you see that over time, it went up and down, up and down, up and down, closer and closer to midnight. And right now we're in a rather precarious um, situation with respect to the two twin uh, possible catastrophes. Um, but the good news is that nuclear weapons over the time have actually been decreasing. Um, and so here I'm showing the number of nuclear weapons as a function of time, so number of years uh, for different countries. So UK is the United Kingdom, France, uh, and so on. And the way I present it here is in terms of uh, decades of 10. So in terms of um, it's logarithmic plots, so in, in, in multiples of 10. And that way you can see uh, the other countries, the countries like North Korea and Pakistan, India, because they have far lower uh, nuclear weapons than the United States and Russia. But you can see everything on one, uh, on one slide. And what you do see is that the number of nuclear weapons uh, is decreasing. I think that's a very, very positive thing. The problem is that um, right now there's a lot of unfortunate interest in nuclear weapons uh, around the world. So this may, you know, reverse itself or, or at least get worse. So this is really pointing to why are we concerned in 2021? Well, we see tensions between China and India India and Pakistan, US and Russia, US and China. And so the situation is not at a state of equilibrium. There's actually a lot, a lot happening and that's really our, our concern. Um, also, all countries are modernizing nuclear weapons um, with the United States, introducing new low yield nuclear weapons. Um, uh, North Korea, of course, introducing new nuclear weapons and, and new delivery systems. And um, luckily in the you know, in the Biden administration, hopefully there will be a change, but thus far we don't really see evidence that spending will be decreased, uh, and that's a concern. Um, I see there's a chat, so I always like to quickly check. Oh, you can see my notes. I'm sorry. Uh, we can we can we can change that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, it doesn't. It's not not a bad thing. Let's see here. We can do it like this. Sorry, sorry that you can see my notes. Um, so there's been a, uh, besides the modernization of nuclear weapon delivery systems and, and so on, there's also sustained interest in fissile material production. So we see this with Iran, we see this with, with other countries as well. And so the concern is that there's just, you know, there is more interest in, in, in nuclear weapons. There's also the fading memory. It's been 75 months, 75 years since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So you know, uh, there's a concern that as as um, the survivors 
uh, 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 you know, pass on. There's not an, not enough real memory about what happened um, in the past. And there's also a possible interest in nuclear testing with the United States accusing Russia of perhaps doing low yield testing and also US um, accusing, this was during the previous administration, um, accusing uh, um, China of doing nuclear testing. Now, this was a report that came out, um, no, I, I guess a few weeks ago uh, from ICANN. Um, and they looked at the total spending of, you know, this is, it's not quite during a pandemic, this was 2019, but it hasn't changed, we expect, in 2020, which is really crazy. $72.9 billion has been spent over one year, uh, this was in 2019, in spending on nuclear weapons. And you can see that uh, for, for the different countries, the United States here with, you know, far the amount the highest amount of uh, spending which is 35 billion dollars um, and then you know followed by other countries as well Russia and, and the UK and so on and they also tried to do an estimate of North Korea of 0 0.6 billion because there's a lot of uh, uh, work being done in North Korea to modernize nuclear weapons to build delivery systems and and so on so that's a concern that we have now, you wouldn't exist if it wasn't for this man. Um, this is, and now I would like to refer to my notes. <laughs> Let me know if this doesn't work, uh, because these are my notes here. Um, so can you see that the notes? Is that a bother? I don't want it to bother. Um, but this is, I wanted to get the name correct, which is Vasily uh, Alexandrovich Ar Arkhipakov, um, who very quickly was able to, because of his quick thinking, his quick uh, ability. Uh, this was during the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis when um, the uh, Soviet submarine went into uh, Cuban waters. And um, it was very, very serious situation because these submarines aren't supposed to go in Cuban, in, in Cuban waters, or they're not, not used to such high temperatures. And the temperatures were extremely high. And the, you know, the pressure was there and tension was there. And then um, uh, there was the, because they didn't, they also didn't have any connection to um, communication in uh, uh, with, with the, with the uh, you know, with, this, with the command. Um, and so what happened was they, uh, they had decided to actually uh, launch uh, nuclear weapons. As I said, here's the quote, we're going to blast them now. We will die, but we will sink them all. We will not be the shame of the fleet. Um, and then they agreed to launch the uh, uh, the torpedo. Uh, however, Arpik Arkhipov, this is this gentleman here, um, and I'm very excited because um, I was able to get permission to put this the, this picture uh, from the wife of Arkhipov, able to get this picture into my book, which I will tell you about uh, just just briefly. A little bit of self, selfless uh, uh, self promotion. Um, uh, and so, Arkhipov, actually, uh, being who's the commodore of the entire Soviet submarine flotilla, actually outranked the person on the submarine, the high person on the uh, submarine. He happened to be on the submarine uh, and, um, and stopped this, uh, this, this from happening, this launch of uh, nuclear weapons. So, this is uh, really quite amazing because. If he wouldn't have thought this, then perhaps uh, you know uh, most scholars think a nuclear war would have happened at the time because tensions um, were so high. So you wouldn't exist if it wasn't for this great, really great person. So here I just wanted to talk about a, uh, a book which I produced with uh, Dr. Wolfson, who's a physicist at the Middlebury College, which was released in uh, March, uh, and. Um, this is a book uh, released uh, by MIT Press focusing on um, nuclear weapons. So I talk a lot about the different types of nuclear weapons. So a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today, um, it talks about nuclear reactors. Um, it talks about um, uh, nuclear nonproliferation, talks about treaties and so on and so on. It's 500 pages and um, we put a lot of effort to try, to try to get it right. It's really up to date up to 2020 basically 
uh, September or October 2020. We try to keep it as up to date as possible. It's also written for the layman. It's not per, not writ layperson. So it's not written for uh, for for um, you know experts and so on. Okay. So what I want to talk about is the nuclear difference. That's the second part. The nuclear difference. So let's start with what I call, what I have a little riddle. Um, what has more energy, TNT or chocolate chip cookies? Right. So um, it might surprise you, but there's more energy density is in chocolate chip cookies than TNT. And so you might wonder, well, if, it, if that's the case, then how come we don't blow up, right? And, and the fact is, is that when we eat chocolate chip cookies, we digest it slowly, energy is released slowly over time, rather than something like TNT, where energy is released very, very fast. And this is really power. Energy per unit time is power. So the power is really, really high. So there's actually eight times higher energy density in chocolate chip cookies than in TNT. Now you might wonder, why do you measure that? But actually, that's actually something that's, that's very, very relevant and, and kind of important. I'm going to be talking about a little bit uh, further now. So you can kind of see TNT here, chocolate chip cookies, energy density, so the energy produced per kilogram, and you see coal as well. Um, but then if you look at fissile materials, uh, nuclear explosive materials or NEM, they have vastly more energy per kilogram uh, than coal. So here I'm imagining that if in the previous scale here, right, this previous graph here, this is 10 centimeters high. Then if you plot uh, uranium on this scale, um, that scale, <laughs> if that graph would be extended, uh, would be up to where the... Um, uh, the distance to where the International Space Station orbits. That's how dramatic the energy dis density difference is between uranium and, um, and, uh, and coal. And now what reactors do is they use this energy very slowly over time. So it's the same energy source as nuclear weapons would be. And uh, Mr. Gustavo Molina will, will talk about the um, the uh, energy production with reactors and the fuel cycle and so on, um, the civilian side. So that energy is used slowly and carefully. Whereas in the case of nuclear weapons, that energy, just like, like uh, TNT, it's released very quickly. So here you have kind of, a, I really like this uh, kind of um, table uh, where you see what's in the nuclear difference. Um, the energy released for chemical energy, so that's like coal and, and uh, explosives, um, is kind of similar to nuclear energy, uh, power reactors, and nuclear explosive materials or nuclear weapons. In the case of the energy release, the slow release is coal energy, chemical energy, um, and then the slow release would be power reactors releasing the you know the fission energy, uh, whereas the very fast release would be high explosives, same source chemical energy, and the nuclear energy would be uh, nuclear explosive materials. And the point, though, is that single fission is a million times more energetic than uh, chemical interactions. And so that's really what we're going to be talking about. That's really the essence of this, uh, what I call the nuclear difference. And the thing is, after you have one fission, it can um, induce or initiate a chain reaction, and that can lead to more uh, fission interactions. All right, so this is what I call, this graph is what I call the nuclear difference, which is chemical and uh, nuclear explosives. So on the left side, what you see is one kilogram of TNT exploding. Okay, so this is just a chemical explosives, you know, one kilogram of TNT. On the right side, I'm showing 15 kilotons of TNT exploding. And this is, of course, a nuclear weapon going off. This is Hiroshima, I believe. And that's one kilogram of uranium-235 that has released all its energy. So when you see this on the, on, the, on, on the scale, you can see what a vast difference this is in terms of, um, in terms of energy density, energy being produced per, per kilogram. So in this case, the yield is 0 0.00001 kiloton because that's one kilogram of TNT. And in this case, it's 15 kilotons of TNT or 15,000 tons of TNT. Now let's take a step back and think about what these numbers really mean. 15,000 tons of TNT, whereas one ton is 1,000 kilograms. So you have 15 million kilograms of TNT being released in this Hiroshima uh, um, 
um, in, in the bomb that exploded on the Japanese city Hiroshima. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it's such a vast uh, amount of en energy uh, being released. And that's, uh, you know, would be considered a very small uh, nuclear weapon um, in today's terms. Horror. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. So um, I always like to show this, uh, these slides because, you know, as we talk about, and, and I'll tell you, when I started getting into this field and interested in, in nuclear weapons and so on, I got very interested in the physics behind it all. But then, you know, you just realize, my goodness, this, these have been, these are terrible weapons. And, and, and even though the physics is interesting, it's, uh, the devastation is, is incredible. So even though we focus on the science, don't ever forget about the unspeakable horror. I always show these slides to kind of ground us in, in understanding um, what these weapons are really all about. And I always find that paintings are, are more powerful than, uh, than, than, than actual photographs um, because the you know the the survivor or the the artist sees it in a different way and may have a different perspective than just what a photograph can capture so now let's talk about nuclear weapons now that we kind of gave this a uh, little bit of an introduction now nuclear uh, um, explosive materials are you know isotopes like uranium 235 and plutonium 239 when i'm talking about isotopes what i'm really talking about is you know, talk about elements uranium is an element hydrogen is an element but then you can have different flavors of the element where the number of neutrons is going to be slightly different okay so uranium 235 will have a different number of neutrons than uranium 238 for example but it's the same element. So chemically, it, it, it interacts the same way. And, and this actually makes it complicated when you're doing uranium enrichment because the chemistry is the same. So you can't use chemistry to, to separate it. Um, it's much more complicated. Um, so if you dig into the ground, or here I'm drinking some milk, if I analyze the milk, I will find out that about there will be some uranium in it. And that uranium, yes, there's uranium in milk. There's uranium in everything. And if you look at that uranium, you'll find that 0.711% is going to be uranium-235, and the rest is basically, basically going to be uranium-238, the other isotope. Now, they're slightly different, right? They're slightly different in mass. Uh, chemically, they behave the same. But that slight difference has, uh, is, is very important in the nuclear world, the nuclear physics world. Um, and from uranium-238, so that's the other side of uranium, so uranium-235 is 0.7%, the you know, dirt or anything you look at here, um, it's going to be 0.7% uranium-235, the rest is going to be uranium-238, and if the uranium-238 interacts with neutrons in a reactor, then it's going to turn into plutonium-239. And the important thing is these two isotopes are used in nuclear weapons, uranium-235 and plutonium-239. Uranium-235 um, is easy to detonate. So it's easy to detonate in what's called a gun-type nuclear weapon, which we're going to be talking about. But the plutonium-239 is much harder to detonate. And that's what we're going to discuss. And you have to, need, you have, to have a different way called the implosion method of uh, actually producing uh, you know, a nuclear weapon detonation to occur. So let's take a step back again. What's a fission interaction? So a fission interaction is when a neutron hits uranium-235 or plutonium-239, then it will split into two or three pieces and give off neutrons. Now, these neutrons, if it's a dense material, will then interact and hit another uranium-235, and that will produce more neutrons. And so you can get what's called um, a chain, chain reaction. In the process, it also releases a lot of energy. And that's the source of the energy that you want to get access to um, for reactors. And also, you know, that's also produces devastation from uh, nuclear weapons. So let's talk about this. Neutron comes in, spits to U-235, then a very, very short time later, 10 to the minus eight seconds. So that's one 10 billionth of a second or 10 nanoseconds. So it's a very short amount of time. Um, it will, that neutron will find another U-235 and split that. And then those neutrons will also split another one and so on and so on and so on. So it doesn't 
it's not hard to figure out that what happens is that first you start with one, then you start with two, then you start with four, one, two, three, four. And then in preceding generations, you produce more and more splittings and more and more neutrons. <clears throat> and you can equate this in terms of how much um, material has actually split. And if you do that, you will find that um, after the 82nd generation, you will produce, a, you will split the equivalent of 940 grams or about one kilogram, which is why I showed on the left side um, of the nuclear difference picture, uh, or uh, um, sorry, the right side uh, was the nuclear explosion, was about one kilogram of, um, of uranium-235 that split. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so if you look at this, and this is just kind of some back of the envelope calculation, this 2 to the exponent 81 is corresponds to a lot of neutrons. This 10 to the exponent to 24 means 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, doing that 24 times. So this is a lot of neutrons that you produce uh, and a lot of fissions. In the process, you give off some energy. And if you add that all up together, you get about 18 kilotons of TNT. So this is your source. It's not quite 15 kilotons. It's, you know, with this simple calculation, it's just 18 kilotons. But this is, it is you know, very similar to the amount of energy that detonated uh, in the case of the bomb that dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The production in, in the energy happened also very, very fast. As you can see this, you have about 100 generations here. And 100 generations times 10 to the minus 8 brings you to 10 to the minus 6 seconds. So that's 1 millionth of a second or 1 microsecond. Right. So you're producing a whole lot of energy. You're producing it very fast within microsecond. And you used up about 1 kilogram of uranium-235. So that gives you a sense of how extreme these weapons are in terms of, you know, how much how much um, energy that's produced. So what are nuclear nuclear weapons? They're rapid assembly of nuclear explosive materials into configuration that will sustain a fast neutron chain reaction. And you need to have at least one neutron released per fission that will produce another fission. So you can get this chain reaction to continue. You need higher than what's called a critical mass. Um, and it must cause a fission rather than being captured or escaped from the configuration. And I'll explain it a little bit um, later on what I'm, what I'm really talking about. And, and so to produce a nuclear explosion, the fast neutrons from each generation of fissions must produce more fast neutrons um, in the next generation. A very useful analogy, a way you can kind of think about this is uh, in terms of mousetraps. And really what I'm talking about here is imagine these mousetraps here that are set together and are set close together, just like if you have uh, a high enrichment uranium-235 or you have a high density of U-235s together, that would be like having many of these mousetraps close together. And these little balls are ping pong balls. And so what you can imagine is that when these you know, these, these um, traps get unclamped, then these ping pong balls will just fly out and fly out and these like the neutrons, hit another one and unclamp that one and so on and so on and so on. And if, if the mouse traps are very close together, then this will happen very fast. And this is basically how it works. If you don't have, so here I will show you, you see there's a plexiglass cover there, which kind of reflects, and you also have reflectors in, with nuclear weapons design. Um, which reflects the ping pong's back, ping pong balls back in. If you if they escape, well, that means that they can't actually hit another uh, mouse trap. So it will, you know, slow down the chain reaction or even peter it out, right? So it matters how close they are together, uh, the the mouse traps, and you know how many will escape and how many will be, you know, we lost and so on. So really, what you want to do is have this chain reaction happen very quickly so that you don't lose any neutrons. All right. So I want to show you this this uh, uh, this kind of demonstration, and this is really how nuclear weapons work. This 
is really really what you need to know uh, really about how nuclear weapons work. What is important here, you want to make sure that these ping pong balls keep on going. You don't want to lose that. So that means that you have to have a certain amount of material that's not too small so that it'll just escape and, and be lost. So it's below a critical mass or below a supercritical mass. You need it to be quite big and you need to reflect these uh, ping pong balls back into the material so that you can you know, sustain the chain reaction. Um, so there's really two types of nuclear weapons that I really wanted to talk about. And the differences between between them is that plutonium, you know, the easiest one, the one that I said is easy to detonate, is uranium two thirty five, right? That's the gun type design. You don't even need to test it. Um, there's a famous quote by Nobel Prize winner uh, Louis Alvarez. Uh, he said it's so simple in design that even a high school kid could do it. Well, that's I I. You think it's a little bit more complicated than that, but really the, the what the barrier there is, is access to the material, right? Access to material. So that's a gun type design. You take basically half critical mass or, uh, you know, it, it, actually in, in, in actual fact, it was much more than half a critical mass. You place these in, um, uh, you, you smash them together very fast and they'll reach a critical mass and you'll sustain the chain reaction and it, and it will explode. Um, now, key to this is that you need to make sure that it will, um, uh, that there's not many uh, kind of background neutrons that will, uh, you know, as it's coming together, will, will start to disintegrate and basically um, uh, deteriorate uh, the, the, the material so that it doesn't become, so when it comes together, it doesn't become a critical mass. Now, if you use plutonium, that is exactly that will happen because you have so many more neutrons in plutonium than in the case of, of uranium. And so before it gets together, it will basically disintegrate. You know, it will produce fissions, but it won't be able to get to complete um, critical mass. Uh, there's 35,000 times more neutrons per kilogram or you know per per mass uh, for weapons grade uh, plutonium. Uh, compared to uh, uh, compared to uranium, and so you really cannot use plutonium um, in a gun type design. So that's a good thing because actually plutonium is very easy to produce. You produce it in reactors from uranium uh, 238. So that's a good thing, um, and it's it's more complicated to produce a nuclear weapon. The technique that you must do is something called an implosion type uh, design, and it, I should say that if for plutonium. You have to use the um, the implosion method, but with for uranium, you can also use the implosion method, right? So that's that's important. So for uranium two thirty five, you can use both the gun type design and the implosion type design. And so what you'll have is in in different designs is you'll combine uh, plutonium and uranium, um, but uh, in the case of plutonium, you can only use the an implosion uh, type design. So you need a faster way to assemble it with plutonium because all these extra neutrons that you have, as I said, 35,000 times more uh, neutrons coming from plutonium compared to uh, uranium. And the idea is that you use explosives to compress, com to compress the material. And basically you're using Newton's law that if you have an action and reaction force, something explodes outward, that means you also have an, an reaction force explo imploding inward. And so, when you have that explosion, the explosive material on the outside here, that exposed outward, you get a compression force and you get the uh, fissile material like plutonium being compressed further um, to reach uh, a, a critical mass. So that's called the implosion uh, type design. Um, and so this was what you need to use for in, in the case of plutonium. So just to kind of summarize, there's two ways to, to, uh, to produce a bomb. Right here, I'm showing the nuclear fuel cycle and the speaker afterward will talk more detail about fuel cycle and, and, and nuclear energy and so on. Um, but this is kind of showing the, uh, the, the, the uh, non-civilian, non-peaceful uh, uh, points uh, in the fuel cycle where uh, you know the material can be used for nuclear weapons. Uh, in the case of uranium, that's you know that's why it's through enrichment. Uh, if it's enriched to a high uh, uh, percentage, like uh, you know greater than ninety percent uranium two thirty five, uh, then it can be used in a gun type design or in an implosion type design. In the case of plutonium, um, 
you know, weapons grade plutonium, say, then it can only be used in an applosion uh, type design. And that comes from um, the spent fuel uh, from a reactor, but I won't get into that um, now. So properties that are important for nuclear weapons is the fissile material reactivity. Uh, you know, you really need to, need to get to critical mass. Uh, and also the configuration that you have is important. So if it would be like a flat sheet, well then naturally all the neutrons, if there would be neutrons there, they will all escape because it, you know you really need it to be a ball or be a sphere, a, a spherical shell or some other design. Um, it, so it's really the configuration uh, that's very important. It needs to be easy to handle. And so the radioactivity and the heat can't be very high. Um, otherwise it's, you know, it's more difficult to produce nuclear weapons, not impossible. As I'll talk about reactor grade, plutonium, uh, reactor grade plutonium, um, but um, it's more difficult. And the neutron background rate needs to be low and I already discussed that. Again, even though we speak about the, the science, don't forget about the horror uh, of this. So as a series of questions I wanted to answer that often come up, which is can non-state actors build nuclear weapons? Well, the barrier is getting the fissile material. U-235 is easy to detonate, as I said, um, but there were some uh, kind of experiments exercises where in the 1960s, the government asked two students that just graduated from grad school to design a gun type design bomb. They had no knowledge of nuclear weapons, although I always kind of doubt that, but that's what they say. Uh, and they designed an implosion type design, a bomb instead. Uh, a Princeton University undergrad designed an implosion weapon as a senior paper. And this is the other, that's a very important point. And I believe that President Biden um, in was Senator Biden a uh, long time ago was the one who suggested this this exercise um, was where uh, the labs, the national labs in the United States uh, were tasked to build to to in a few months build an, a, a gun type design bomb with all the commercially available materials without breaking any laws. So this really tells you, you know, the sensitivity and what kind of laws should be changed so that it's more difficult to uh, uh, to produce nuclear weapons, except for getting the fissile material. And they were able to do that um, in a few months. So it's important uh, to, to point out that really the big barrier there is getting access to the fissile material, getting access to highly enriched uranium, um, which are used in reactors all across the world. And that's why it's so important to minimize the use of uh, highly enriched uranium. So is the, you know, the IEA has a significant quantity, which is the, you know, the minimum is, which is basically uh, the amount needed for a nuclear weapon, the mass needed, which is called a you know, significant quantity. It does not take into account losses, losses in machining and so on. Um, but what is important is that the SQ is uh, much higher uh, than, uh, than what is actually needed for a bomb. And that's really what I wanted to point out here is that if you look at the yield for a nuclear weapon for uh, you know, different technical countries with different technical capabilities, then you see that for plutonium where the SQ is, um, is eight kilograms, um, you see that you can produce uh, you know, a, a 20 kiloton bomb with uh, three kilograms of plutonium. So that SQ, the significant quantity, is really set way higher than, um, uh, than needed uh, to produce a bomb. So don't be mistaken that, for example, 25 kilograms uranium-235 is the minimum amount that you need for a bomb. That's not the case at all. As you can see here, that you can produce a 20, 20 kiloton bomb with using only five kilograms uh, of highly enriched uranium. Now, it's important to point out the significant quantity uh, takes into account, uh, you know, machining and and so on, some losses due to that material, but it's never going to be uh, as much as say 25 kilograms. As you can see here, that number is much, uh, much lower. If you want to produce a one kiloton yield, you only need about 2.5 kilograms of uranium-235. And the other point is that in 2008, as part of the six party talks, uh, North Korea actually declared that two kilograms of plutonium were used for the 2006 test. Now that was a very small test, but it was still a, a nuclear explosion. And in 2012, the Soviet test uh, result was declassified uh, where they showed that uh, they produced, uh, you know, 1.6 kiloton tests, which is, you know, right up here uh, with one kilogram of, um, 
uh, uh, of plutonium. So actually, the former deputy director general of the IEA, Heinen, Olin Heinen, uh, called for uh, the plutonium, uh, plutonium SQ to decrease uh, to something like two to four kilograms because it's set so high. Um, and we wrote a paper on this uh, focused on um, looking at you know, what would be involved in, in changing that, but it looks like that's something that would be something that um, there would be a lot of resistance to actually being able to do that. So the other question that comes up, and that's really where I'm you know, getting close to ending, what I really wanted to, wanted to emphasize is, it's a question that comes up is, can a bomb be made from reactor grade plutonium? So by reactor grade plutonium, what I'm talking about is um, when you put when you produce plutonium for nuclear weapons, then you place the uranium-238 basically um, in a reactor that produces plutonium-239, and then you um, the plutonium-239 can produce some plutonium-240. But what you do is you extract it from the reactor so that it's as high in plutonium-239 as possible. However, if you have uh, react if if you know if you if reactor grade plutonium then the plutonium that's being produced stays in the reactor for a very long time. And so the plutonium-239 doesn't stay as plutonium-239, but it actually changes into a certain fraction uh, of plutonium-240. So you have something like, you know, whatever number it's going to be, 20% plutonium-240 and then 80% plutonium-239 and then other isotopes as well. And the problem is, or, you know, from point of nuclear weapons is that plutonium-240 um, is, is uh, produces so many neutrons. Remember, you don't want to have too many neutrons. Produces so many spontaneous neutrons um, that it's a problem uh, for nuclear weapons. And some countries believed that um, react that you can't make bombs from reactor grade plutonium. But in fact, um, although there's problems with reactor grade plutonium, um, you can get around them and you can produce you know, nuclear weapons, not as high yield as, uh, as weapons grade plutonium, but you can still produce effective uh, nuclear weapons using uh, reactor grade plutonium. You can, if you, if you think about it here, you, here I'm comparing the two different types of reactivity, so that radioactivity, so that really means, you know, um, how radioactive it is. So um, is, the re is it so radioactive that it's difficult to work with? Um, as you can see here, the difference is a factor of three, and that's not a very large difference. You really need it to be, you know, 100 times higher radioactivity for it to be, you know, to, uh, to, be, to be what's called self-protecting or that you really can't handle it at all. There's no way to handle it. We really find that this not really a, a serious barrier. The other thing is the neutron background. Yes, there is an increase in, in the number of neutrons, a factor of five, uh, generally, um, which can be a problem, but that's something that you can work with. It's just the yield won't be as high as um, you know, weapons-grade plutonium, but you can still produce a, a, a nuclear explosion. And then the other thing is heat. Heat is often talked about. Um, uh, this is watts per kilogram, so it's you know, energy released uh, per second per kilogram. Um, and in the case of weapon grade plutonium compared to reactor grade plutonium, it's basically a factor of three times more. And by uh, working with the material through, uh, you know, remote means and so on, and and heat sinks, um, it's not uh, it's not very difficult to produce a bomb out of uh, reactor grade plutonium. Um, and that's uh, you know really important to remember. So. Uh, a military useful first generation nuclear explosive using reactor grade plutonium can be designed to produce nuclear yield in the multi kiloton range. And with reactor grade plutonium, the yield would be at least one kiloton, kiloton or more, uh, but it could also be higher. It's going to be not as high as weapons grade plutonium, but you can still produce a, a large um, explosion. All right. So modern nuclear weapons are slightly different. I'm getting to the end of my presentation. Modern nuclear weapons are a little bit different. Um, really, what I talked about is the bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that uh, you know, older generation nuclear weapons um, that quickly changed and they produced something called boosted nuclear weapons, in which case a small amount of deuterium and tritium gas. So these are isotopes. Remember, I talked about isotopes. You have isotopes of uranium. Well, you also have isotopes of hydrogen. And deuterium and tritium are two isotopes that are chemically behave like hydrogen. Um, but in the nuclear world, they behave differently. And if you add a small amount of deuterium tritium gas uh, to the core of the nuclear weapons, then what will happen is the heat and the pressure 
uh, will increase the efficiency of the uh, of the chain reaction. What I mean by that is actually you're you're fusing the Ds and Ts together, and so you you produce uh, more neutrons, and that extra burst of neutrons that you get uh, ends up fissioning more material than it would if uh, if you would not have that that boost. So that's where really it's called boosted nuclear weapons. So even though it's the source itself is fusion energy, we don't consider it as you know a fusion bomb. That's we just consider it as kind of increasing the efficiency, and thus it also increases the yield. So when nuclear when North Korea um, exploded its nuclear weapons a, a few years ago, then we kind of concluded well because the yield is so high, um, it's not likely that it could be done with just a pure uh, fission weapon. Um, it's likely that that there's also well, that there's also a boosting uh, phase to it. Um, and then there's also staged nuclear weapons. That's really talking about the the you know the last uh, I think it was 2017 detonation uh, by North Korea, the large you know 150 kiloton. You know there's different uh, estimates about how high the yield was for that test. Uh, stage nuclear weapons uh, like a hydrogen bomb. In this case, you do have the fusion stage, and that's called the secondary here, um, where you have a fission bomb as the primary. So the primary and the secondary. The fission bomb is the boosted weapon, so that produces a you know a, a, a large explosion, um, and so this will will um, basically uh, transfer the heat to the secondary. There's a certain distance between the transfer the heat to the secondary that will compress the material. Uh, and then um, because it has been compressed, the temperature also increases inside here. And if you have fusion uh, material, um, then uh, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll initiate fusion to happen that will also produce uh, a lot of neutrons. Then these neutrons themselves will fission the, uh, you know, it depends on what the design is going to be, uh, will can fission uh, further uh, uranium uh, and you'll produce more uh, fission. So in fact, what happens is, and this is another important point, is when people think about a, uh, you know, a, a fusion bomb, they think of, you know, it's just fusion energy. And, and uh, that's not the case at all, in fact. It turns out to be, and so it depends on different estimates give you different numbers, um, but basically 25% uh, of the energy that's released is basically going to be fusion energy and the rest is going to be fission energy because you're using the fusion neutrons that you produce uh, through the interaction um, to, to cause more, uh, more fissions. So just to kind of summarize, uh, you have the implosion bomb that kind of, you know, kind of triggers the bomb. You get a boosting by, in, by introducing the thorium and tritium gas inside the, um, inside the primary fission bomb that increases the efficiency. This produces heat that heats the secondary. It's, you know, of course, way more complicated than this, but I'm kind of giving you a picture of how, what it works. That causes fusion reactions to start inside the secondary. This leads to further fissions and that will produce uh, very large yields. And that's called a hydrogen bomb. Okay. So where are we now? Where are we now? Well, in fact, um, this is actually just a picture from a, from a movie, but it does kind of point to the important thing is that in 2018, uh, Russia unveiled a bunch of different scary uh, weapons. One is called Skyfall, um, which is a nuclear powered uh, um, nuclear weapon delivery cruise missile. So can you imagine? Can you imagine a cruise missile um, which is uh, which is powered by nuclear energy uh, which deploys uh, nuclear weapons. And so the point is is that this cruise missile, because it's it's powered by nuclear energy, doesn't actually have to land. It will just be cruising around for very large distances. We know there were um, uh, um, failures in tests that have happened in the past. Uh, you know, let's hope that this will never be um, deployed. Um, the other is this kind of bizarre autonomous uh, um, uh, torpedo. And that's kind of what I'm showing here, which would be detonating, would produce a very large tidal wave and uh, a whole lot of other stuff. Really awful when you think about um, these modern uh, nuclear weapons uh, that are being designed and that people are working on. So why are we concerned in 2021 or why am I <laughs> concerned? 
Well, we are very lucky in the 75 years that have, have passed. Um, you know, there have been no, uh, no, there have been some accidents with nuclear weapons, but no uh, further uh, nuclear weapons used in combat. Um, but our luck may simply uh, run out. So this is kind of summarize what I really wanted to say is that nuclear fission has an insanely high energy density. And so what I mean here is the energy per mass of the fuel. So think about, again, think back about what we talked about the chocolate chip cookies. We talked about TNT and we talked about um, uh, nuclear energy and nuclear energy is just you know way up there in terms of energy uh, density. And nuclear fission also has an insanely high, uh, oh, sorry, I have two, two, two of the same ones here. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's amazing how much energy is being released. And also really what I wanted to say was there, sorry, I, I copied and pasted wrong, is power. It's an immense amount of power that's released per second, right? If we think about a bomb, you're releasing, you know, 80, 150 kilotons or so on in a very, very uh, short amount of time, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in a millisecond or a microsecond. And so, uh, uh, you know, it, it's it's really very high amount of energy that's produced, and that energy has to go somewhere and should produce a blast wave. Nuclear weapon effects is a whole other um, uh, lecture, which we don't have time for this time. Um, and the other thing that's important to remember is that um, nuclear weapons use fissile materials like uranium-235 and plutonium-239. There are other materials out there as well, um, but these are the two ones that, that are really being used um, in practice. Um, and reactor grade plutonium can be used to make nuclear weapons, uh, but plutonium can't be used in a gun type design. And the other thing is that modern weapons used, uh, you know, boosted or boosted designs. So you have this deuterium tritium gas that I talked about, and uh, can have th and thermonuclear weapons are these multiple stage weapons where you have something like a hydrogen bomb. Um, I should, set, should mention something else. There are other types of bombs as well. So there's also something called salted bombs. And what do I mean by salted bombs? Uh, it's another crazy idea, which is to uh, around the um, uh, diffusion stage, because that's where you produce the most neutrons, you also have a, a layer of something like, uh, uh, um, you know, a different type of metal or something, uh, cobalt metal, uh, that will produce uh, cobalt-60 uh, gamma rays for a long time. So you produce cobalt-60, which stays around for five years, and this is more like this massive uh, uh, dirty bomb uh, that would happen. It's, it's really a uh, uh, horrible thing. So these are called salted bombs. All right, so I thought I'd uh, end it uh, here. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about um, the timeline of uh, nuclear power, nuclear fusion. Uh, and the different steps of uh, uh, the film cycle, uh, from meaning, miling, conversion, enrichment, fabrication of fuel for possible uh, uh, use, irradiation in a nuclear reactor, storage of spent fuel, the processing, and disposal. Well, this is a, a timeline. Um, the Manhattan project uh, was on from 1939 to 1941 when the, the project produced nuclear weapons. Uh, in 1945, they were used in uh, two uh, cities of Japan, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In 1953, there were some boiling reactor experiments and uh, in 1955, it was the first nuclear-powered submarine. Uh, in 1986, the Chernobyl uh, explosion occurred in an Ukrainian uh, reactor. Oh, let, let me see. I am passing through. Uh, in 1939, uh, this was the first split of uh, uranium atoms. This was in, uh, well, experiments. 
1942, these experiments were done in, in Germany. Uh, in 1942, the first controlled self sustained fission reactor occurred in a pile in Chicago. In 1951, it was the first experimental breeder reactor. Uh, it first usable energy from nuclear reactors. In 1954, the Atomic Energy Act of uh, uh, US occurred. Uh, in 1979, the Freeman Island uh, accident occurred, which the destruction of uh, the nucleus. And uh, in 2011, the Fukushima uh, Daiichi uh, uh, accident occurred, which damaged four reactors. Well, the nuclear fission, as uh, Frederick explained, of course, when a uh, uh, chain reactor uh, uh, is started with uh, uh, neutrons, which are multiplied with uh, success, uh, successive uh, fusions in reactors in the vicinity. Okay, as uh, Frederick explained very well, the energy that uh, is uh, released during a single fission in an atom is about one million times higher than a chemical reactor reaction in um, a chemical substance, for instance, um, uh, the oxidation of uh, car uh, carbon atom. So uh, uh, the energy density of uh, 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 nuclear energy is much higher than the chemical that we can obtain from uh, a chemical reaction. Uh, this uh, property can be used in the production of uh, uh, energy for civilian use or in uh, atomic weapons. Well, this uh, uh, map shows the nuclear reactors in, in the world uh, in different colors. You can see how many reactors have in the country. The higher is the US, which is uh, about close to 100 reactors. And there are several countries uh, with uh, one or two uh, reactors. Um, okay, the, the, the nuclear fuel cycle starts with uh, uh, the extraction of uh, uranium ore from the soil. Then uh, the uh, a milling, milling plant concentrates this uranium or yellow cake, which has uh, eight atoms of oxygen and three of uh, uranium. Uh, then uh, this uh, uh, uranium oxide is converted in UF6. It's, uh, gaseous compound of uranium in order to be enriched in uh, uh, centrifugation, cascade uh, uh, devices. These devices uh, are rotating at about 1000 RPM. So it's very difficult to, 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 to build and the materials are um, also difficult to get. Um, then once the uranium hexafluoride is uh, enriched, uh, it is converted in uh, EO2, uh, uranium dioxide, to produce pellets to be used in uh, um, fuel, uh, nuclear fuel. 
which are introduced in nuclear reactor, reactors. Of course, there are different uh, fuels, but uh, normally the nuclear fuel is made of uranium dioxide because uh, good properties uh, of uh, uh, temperature, uh, fusion, etc. When once the nuclear fuel is used in a nuclear reactor um, and uh, the energy is released and used, the uh, fuel needs to be reprocess it to uh, extract uh, the remaining uranium, the produced plutonium, and the fission products. Uh, the remaining uranium and uh, the plutonium can be used uh, in new fuel as MOX fuel or uh, in case of uh, uranium, new uranium fuel. And the fission products is taken for uh, storage and disposal. And this is the, the, the last part of uh, the, the, the fuel cycle, the disposal of high level waste. Uh, if the, the process is done, we are talking about a closed fuel cycle. And uh, when the fuel uh, which is spent is not reprocessed, we are talking about open uh, cycle. Well, the mining it can be done in open uh, pit mines or in underground uh, uh, mine. Uh, also can be done on site using uh, uh, leaching solution for dissolve the ore inside and uh, this is uh, an easier way to do it uh, uh, and uh, uh, uranium is very abundant in, in nature uh, it is about 500 times more abundant than gold and uh, uh, as abundant as common as tin so uh, we find uranium everywhere. Uh, uh, even the sea uh, water is with high, high but uh, 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 great amounts of uh, uranium they solve. It can even uh, can be used uh, or could be used uh, as a source of uranium for energy production. Well, the milling is uh, generally done close to the uranium mine. Uh, it extracts uranium from the ore. Uh, the mining uranium first is crushed and chemically uh, treated to separate uranium from the rock. The result of this uh, operation is yellow cake, which is a yellow powder of uranium oxide. Um, yellow cake concentration is uh, more than 80 percent uh, and uh, the original ore normally is about 0.1 percent of uranium. Uh, after milling the, the yellow cake concentrate is shipped to a conversion facility and where the remaining, the remainder of the ore containing uh, most of the radioactivity and all the rock material becomes tailings, I mean, not, not, not through the use. Then the, the once we have uh, uh, the yellow cake, we need to uh, convert it in uranium uh, extra fried for uh, the processing in a centrifugation 
facility. Uh, this yellow cape uh, primarily is dissolved in nitric acid, then extracted with solvents. Um, and the, the extraction is made uh, with uh, liquid liquid uh, extraction. Um, then this purified solution uh, is precipitated and, uh, to uh, with ammonium hydroxide and produces uh, ammonium the urinate. Then this uh, calcinated with an uh, hydrogen atmosphere to produce uh, GO2 and then it's uh, converted in F6 with a step of US4. The first step is, in, is made with uh, uh, hydrochloric acid and then with uh, uh, fluor gas. The US6 uh, is stored in large cylinders uh, and uh, used uh, in, well, taken to the uh, integration facility. Uh, this is done uh, for enrichment of this uh, US6. In uh, a, a lot of success, uh, success uh, um, steps I mean, a lot of uh, cylinders for propagation, uh, and then the, it passes the, the the concentration starting with 0.7 percent uh, of U235 to what you want to to, to, to mean. For, for instance, for nuclear reactors, the concentration is less than 5%, but for nuclear weapons, the concentration uh, is more than 90%. The, there is a convention now used in uh, civilian activities and uh, uh, research reactors, concentrations of U235 less than 20%. So this is a view of the enrichment facility. The, on the left, you can, you can see uh, uh, the uh, uh, centrifuge in first generation. Uh, in the second uh, picture, you, you see the cylinders for centrifugation, which is um, uh, a lot of centrifuge, uh, and the second, the third generation technology is laser excitation. Um, I don't see if there is actually in, in commercial use, but technically it's proven. Uh, also, this uh, in, the, in the right a diagram of uh, a centrifuge. How is it working and how uh, is uh, uh, entering the centrifuge in, in gaseous form? The uranium is introduced, and step by step is uh, getting high concentration. Then, once the enriched uranium is transformed in U2, it is uh, compressed secret to make pellet. This pellet, uh, depending on uh, the design of, of the fuel, but typically from 8 to 15 millimeters in diameter and 10 to 15 millimeters long. Um, then this uh, pellet inside uh, tubes to make bundles of fuel are irradiated in a room of the reactor. Then they release 
uh, energy by fusion with neutrons. And uh, the, the bombardment of neutrons uh, are producing um, fission products by, by, by fission, of course, energy. But there are other uh, um, elements and isotopes from this irradiation. Uh, one of them is the production of um, plutonium and uh, also different uh, isotopes uh, uh, like uh, plutonium, well, it's plutonium 239, 431 to 42. Uh, the plutonium has, plutonium 239 has 24,000 years of uh, half life. So it's very long lived uh, isotope. Uh, and through activation, uh, it also produces uh, all, all, this other type of plutonium, which and rapidly, rapidly decay to uh, an origin isotope. Uh, also, there are some activation uh, uh, products um, which uh, uh, form the uh, encapsulation of the fuel. And when you reprocess, you have to get all these things the activation products, the, the uranium remaining, the plutonium, and fission products is most more or less uh, in the left what happens in the reactor and the, in, the, in, the, in the right a diagram of uh, uh, a reactor for instance this a uh, uh, PWR reactor which is uh, uh, cooled with uh, natural water then the fuel is stored the main reason to be stored is to cool the uh, fuel in terms of heat and also radioactivity because uh, most of the uh, radiation comes from elements which have short half lives so they need to be uh, stored for uh, a number of years to be cooled down. Uh, then uh, it can be either reprocessed, be reprocessed, or um, be uh, uh, disposed of. Uh, what is processing? Well, the reprocessing uh, uh, processes. Um, start with the reception of uh, the fuel, uh, the radiated fuel, where it is um, dismantled as, as long as it is uh, practical. Then it's chopped in small uh, pieces. Then it is uh, dissolved in nitric acid. And uh, through several steps, it is uh, um, separated um, essentially by uh, uh, liquid liquid extraction and then purified. Uh, at the end, you can uh, have um, the different in, in the different currents of the, the plant. You can have uh, the also there are different processes there is no not a single process that uh, is used but at the end you, you, you get your, uh, uranium uh, uh, plutonium and fission products basically it is the purpose of this uh, reprocessing then um you need to to, to uh, dispose the fuel of um, the after many uh, discussions of uh, uh, what to do with the fuel, the um, uh, consensus is that the uh, very deep 
before uh, uh, facilities is the best option for uh, where to put the spent fuel, even or uh, in, in the form of uh, fuel or in the form of the processed uh, material. Uh, if the fuel is the process, the, the, the main radioactivity comes from the fission products. The uh, consensus is to have these fission products uh, in glass form because glass is naturally a form which prevents leaching of material uh, with water or to stop or to reduce the leaching. So the, the uh, fission products mobilized in glass are put in uh, canisters. Normally these canisters are uh, going to be, uh, normally in, in, in bronze. Why bronze? Because bronze has a long survival time uh, we can see bronze uh, metal from ancient uh, civilizations, even in seawater, and uh, uh, it is very uh, um, has a very long uh, survival uh, in, in, in this condition. So that, that's why bronze is uh, one of the main. Uh, and materials to fill this canister. Uh, also, the, the, there are some several hot drops identified as the best way to, to put this uh, spent fuel uh, for disposal. Uh, one is granite, uh, also is uh, clay. Uh, this is the main two uh, hot drops. Uh, for some time, it, it was also included the, 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 the salt uh, rocks, but actually the, the, the main uh, or uh, the first, first uh, uh, rocks for hosting the, 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 the disposal are clay and granite. Well, the closest countries that are uh, achieving the uh, uh, disposal of uh, spent fuel is France, Finland, and Hungary. Uh, okay, this is a, a, a view of what uh, is going to do with the process of fuel. Uh, the, the, once the fuel is reprocessed, you can reprocess uh, uranium and plutonium in a MOX fuel. And uh, it is only uh, reduced the uranium, it will be in a normal uh, uranium oxide fuel. And it is used again in a nuclear reactor. Uh, the, the advantage of using MOX fuel is that uh, plutonium, which has uh, 24,000 years of hard life. It is um, reduced and burned in, in, in a reactor and uh, avoiding the need to disposal. Uh, the main reason to produce it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Um, and thanks, I don't know, Ferenc, thank you for staying on. I know you also had uh, another uh, engagement. So we have two excellent presentations, uh, one on kind of nuclear weapons um, and how they work and the dangers that they represent, uh, and another very good presentation um, on nuclear energy and the nuclear fuel cycle uh, and everything that goes with that. So uh, we are already a little bit over time, uh, but I am... I think that there would be opportunity for, for questions. So uh, the floor is now open. I see um, 
Fernanda raised a hand. Um, please go yes. ahead. Thank you very much. And thank you for the presentation. I don't know if this is because I know nothing about uh, nuclear energy, but it look, it seemed to me like a very long process. So I wanted to ask, how long does the fuel cycle really take? I guess the question is, how fast can a nuclear weapon be produced? Maybe I insist, maybe this is because I know nothing about it. And it seemed like a very, very, very long process. But I was just wondering, how, how long does it take the cycle? Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to take uh, Anna's question, and then if uh, maybe our two speakers may wish to respond. Thank you. Um, so I, I, something that I've been wondering about is um, the, the quantities, you know, the amount of material that exists and how we can uh, reprocess it and, and um, you know, thinking also about like environmental aspects and all of this. Um, but, but something that I wanted to, to see if you can help me understand better is, uh, for example, when we look at all the amounts of nuclear material that is being used for, um, for, for producing nuclear weapons for, for military purposes, uh, and I know that there are big disparities between countries, but let's say we take the amount that the U.S. has, that is the, the biggest amount. How does that compare to the amount of, of nuclear material that is used for civilian purposes? Uh, is it like a lot more, a lot less? Um, and if, if, for example, if the U.S. decided tomorrow to disarm and to turn all of the, the nuclear material into a civilian uh, program, uh, would that be something that can be done? Is the, is the amount of, of uh, nuclear material that exists, uh, you know, could, could it be converted? How would that work? Um, would it be enough to, I don't know, to produce power for the whole world or you know, are, do you have any any like uh, analogies that you can help us understand regarding the amounts and how that can be processed? Um, and especially thinking on, um, yeah, the environmental aspect, is that something that could be uh, addressed uh, if we're looking at a disarmament process, for example? Thank you. I see there's another question by Ricardo and then we'll go to the responses. Ricardo, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for giving me the floor. I have actually a couple of questions. First for Professor uh, Dalnoki. Um, how big actually does a reactor have to be in order to produce all the materials and to produce all this fission that you were uh, referring to in order to produce uh, materials to create nuclear weapons? And I'm, I'm making this question thinking about the cases of Iraq, for instance, you know, and the invasion that happened afterwards. Um, and, you know, maybe the facilities also and the process and the waste disposal that it's required for this uh, could be used as a, as a mean to pinpoint perhaps where uh, these processes are happening. And if they're not like mapped or pinned in a map where this is using for peaceful purposes. Um, and and uh, the other question I have is for Professor Molina. Uh, you know, well, when you were referring to this process of of, uh, of refining the, the uranium and, and, and plutonium, that you talked about the pellets, that these are like the byproducts. So can these pellets be weaponized? Uh, is there like a particular chain of custody on these uh, pellets? So, you know, if, if in, in, in any given case, they may fall in the hands of, of terrorist organizations or, or whatever. And... Um, Another question I have is this, this fuel that was already used and is to be disposed, can this fuel be used and refined again to produce some kind of byproduct to create nuclear weapons? Uh, and can this product process made by individuals, not necessarily in facilities designed for that purpose? Thank you. We have a lot of questions, so uh, good questions, and I'm sure we'll get very good answers. And I just ask if you um, can mute your microphones uh, because we're getting some feedback in the background. Thank you. Um, so, Ferenc and uh, Gustavo, I don't know how in which order you want to go. <laughs> Ferenc, you want to go first? Sure. I mean, there's uh, very good questions. Um, so, uh, in terms of how fast the fuel cycle and kind of the the times involved in making nuclear weapons, 
that's a very important point when it comes to safeguards with the IEA um, in terms of the materials. Um, so when we think, and this kind of answers another question, which is a little bit later on in terms of a reactor, let's imagine that you have a certain, let's think about the Iraq reactor in, in Iran, um, the previous uh, version of it. Now it's been modified. Um, but in terms of the number of nuclear weapons it could produce in just one year of uh, producing plutonium, that's really how you measure it. And the way you can actually, there's a very easy kind of um, uh, rule of thumb that you can have with reactors is that if you take the number of, you know, the power of the reactor, so let's say it's 100 megawatts or something, 100 megawatts thermal, as they say, and then it will produce about one gram plutonium per day per megawatt electric and so megawatt thermal. So that allows you just basically multiply, let's say 100, 100 megawatt reactor times one gram and you can, get, you can figure out how much plutonium has been produced. Now, that is a very important point in terms of how many, you know, the, the, the time scale in producing nuclear weapons. And that's what people think about often is, you know, this particular reactor is 40 megawatts. It can produce, you know, eight bombs or something per year. And so you can kind of get a scale of what it is. Now, if we talk about a power reactor, so, you know, large uh, gigawatt electric reactors that produce about three gigawatt thermal, um, those types of reactors produce way more uh, plutonium than, uh, than, you know, what are called uh, research reactors way, way, way more. But because the IEA is, you know, whenever it's being refueled, IEA is right there monitoring how everything is going. And this is the importance of safeguards. You know, you can be sure that it's not going to be uh, diverted, but there's way more plutonium because the power is much higher. Okay, so I hope that kind of gives a sense of, of the scale and of the, you know, when, when we're thinking about how much, how, many, how much time does it take to produce a nuclear weapon? We think in these terms, and this is a very important thing in terms of the timeliness criterion for the IEA and that Gustavo can talk about this more, a very important uh, criterion to figure out, you know, at what point is it, is, is it becoming sensitive in terms of being able to produce, um, uh, you know, enough plutonium or, or even enriched material. So I think, Gustav, maybe you can, uh, you know, make remarks about that <laughs> as well. So, uh, as you said, um, uh, let's talk about the environmental uh, aspects of nuclear power. In the question of, of, of our participant, uh, uh, we, we can say that the, the, the uh, in, in environmental impact of the entire cycle of uh, the, the nuclear uh, materials is mm, minimum. I and mean, compared with even the uh, solar energy or wind energy for producing electricity, the uh, nuclear energy has less impact uh, because we are, if we are considering from the mining and uh, the production of electricity, the, 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 the entire uh, nuclear fuel cycle has lesser impact on, on the environment. Even if we consider the uh, accidents that have happened, the big accident with uh, releasing of nuclear material, for, for example, um, Chernobyl and Fukushima. Uh, so in, in terms of environmental impact, is much less uh, than the other options. Uh, of course, the, there are people or groups which are against nuclear energy that uh, uh, say it is more uh, dangerous and more, uh, has more impact, but a serious uh, evaluation of the options say that nuclear energy is better in terms of environmental impact. Uh, another question is about pellets. Can the pellets be used on, on, on uh, I mean, weapons? The answer is no. Uh, the, the pellets and the concentrations used in nuclear power can only be critical because they have a moderator, which is water. And uh, when uh, these uh, pellets are uh, fused 
because of heat, they uh, do not explode. So the question is no. Um, I, I don't remember other, other, other questions, but uh, Frederick has done good answers of, of, of the other one. Okay, I can, uh, there was also a question about, let's see here, the quantity of material. Um, so in terms of civilian material, um, there, there is an awful lot of material in the world that's being used, especially highly enriched uranium is being used. So that's being used in reactors. Um, it's being used um, for targets, for isotopes, that, you know, for, for, for producing cancer, uh, what's called MOLY-99 or malignant 99 uh, which is a cancer drug, which is very important. Um, and there's been a program around the world to try to reduce it as much as possible, reduce the use of HEU. In the military sector, there's a lot of uh, fissile material that's being used for weapons. So these are all, you know, these would be the materials that are used, um, you know, in the nuclear weapons themselves. Also, there's also military, there's also, um, uh, you know, military reactors as well. But that's, and of course, the reactors in, uh, in submarines, which use highly enriched, very, very highly enriched uh, uh, uranium. Um, but the amounts, uh, oh, and the other thing is I wanted to say is uh, there was a great program called Megatons to Megawatts, which I'm not sure if you've, you've heard about in the 1990s, um, which was to convert something like 500 tons of highly enriched uranium that was used for weapons. Uh, it, you know, was, was downgraded into material that could be used for um, or, or um, decoded and, and then used for, uh, uh, for electricity. So there was a... The, there was a program between the between Russia and the United States where that Russian material was sold to the United States and that material was then uh, down blended and then used for um, uh, used for power and reactors which is just a, you know an, a beautiful thing that you uh, that you could actually um, do that um, so uh, I, I guess that the, the important point is to 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 say is that, uh, highly enriched uranium is the, uh, I, I see a very significant threat now because it is used in civilian uh, civilian purposes, like I said, for isotopes, for um, so for medical isotope production, for in reactors. Um, the nice thing is, is that if you use highly enriched uranium, then you can produce much more compact reactors. So you can understand then why do submarines like to use it because you can make them you know, can make it more compact. Why do universities have research reactors that use highly enriched uranium? Is because you can make it more compact and put in a smaller um, footprint. So that's, um, but but in actual fact, that's what I really want to emphasize is there's a program around the world um, between also Russia has this and the United States have this um, uh, to try to convert these highly, these uh, research reactors that have highly enriched uranium as their their fuel source to convert them to low enriched uranium. And basically almost all reactors so far have been converted. Um, there's a lot of Russian reactors that have not been converted, um, but, but, uh, but there are some very um, highly complex reactors in the United States and in Europe uh, and also in, in Russia um, that are very high power and very high neutron flux. And so that means that they have, that they're to actually convert them Use, to use LEU is much more complicated. But we're, the nice thing is that we're kind of gearing to the last final stage of conversion of those, uh, those reactors, thanks to a very large you know, program around the world to try to actually convince the, re the reactor operators that this is an important thing and, and uh, to decrease the amount of material. The other thing is the reason why it's so important is because HEU, remember, what I said is is um, easy to detonate. I use the words kind of, it's not easy to detonate, but I, I, I meant it as a way, the material's easy to convert to use for a nuclear weapon because you don't need to test it. So it's not like an implosion type design, but it's like a gun type design. And that's really the important thing. Um, see if there's anything else. What? I think uh, I think I've answered a lot of the questions, but let me know if something if you want to ask some more questions. Thank you, Ferenc. Um, I, I would like to uh, have. Oh, yes, please go ahead. 
uh, the, one of the questions that are normally done to, to nuclear um, uh, people is uh, what is the importance of using civilian nuclear power? Well, the reason is uh, uh, we compare costs, the cost of uh, uh, producing nuclear energy uh, against other means is uh, they are equivalent. The main reason is that uh, we can use these nuclear reactors in a continuous way all the time and at, at full power is the main use of the uh, nuclear reactor. This is not the case with uh, the uh, solar power or wind power. The, the, these are uh, not continuous. It means not, all, not always it's uh, sunshine or not always is wind uh, uh, available. So the main reason is that we can produce continuously. And uh, uh, if we do not uh, store the energy, uh, the nuclear power would be uh, competitive. So uh, it is the main reason why we use nuclear, nuclear power. Thank you, Gustavo. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, Zemena, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for both presentations. Um, I have to say that it was not easy everything to, to understand because I think there are so many technical things that um, I think I have to read a little bit about in, in your book, uh, Mr. Danowski. Um, thank you for, uh, very much for your recommendation. I want to know uh, perhaps um, what kind of addition technology it's necessary to, to produce nuclear weapons. Well, in, in terms of the, the technology itself, you know, the fact that it's, it was there in the 1940s, it's not particularly new technology. Right. Um, there have been uh, changes, you know, as I was saying, with with new types of nuclear weapons. But basically, technology itself is not a, not really a new technology. We think about what Gustavo was talking about in terms of enrichment. There has been some, uh, you know, a lot of research when it comes to enrichment, which is concerning, uh, actually, which is laser enrichment, which is another way besides a gas centrifuges. But in terms of, um, you know, new technology, they're kind of old, dumb weapons, is <laughs> how I kind of look at it. Um, of course, there's the, uh, the delivery systems that are, that are different. Um, the delivery systems are the uh, missiles and so on, uh, where there's a lot of effort and a lot of spending in terms of uh, producing uh, more accurate uh, as accurate as possible uh, um, uh, delivery of the weapons. But in terms of producing the weapons, I know a lot of people will kick me, but basically that technology has been around for a very long time. Um, there's, of course, there's, uh, there's a lot of technology when it comes to uh, understanding the safety of nuclear weapons and all that stuff, having you know, small improvements and so on. But I can't say it's at least it's my my understanding of it. It's not like there's some new technology out there that has you know made a, a, a big difference or will make a big difference in nuclear weapons. And I think that's a very good thing. What people talk about a lot these days is um, well, diff there's different fusing, but that's not even that's not such high technology. But people talk a lot about uh, you know different types of missiles. Um, so. Uh, that's where I see there's a lot of technology, different types types of delivery systems, but not really in the weapons themselves. Thanks, friends. Uh, if you and Gustavo have time for one more question, so uh, we'll wrap this up with Enrique. You have the last question. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for this uh, great presentation. So my question is for uh, Dr. Molina. Uh, Dr. Molina mentioned that nuclear energy is better for the environment. 
but isn't it true that it is very expensive to produce and in order to meet the current uh, demand of energy in the world, we would need to build around 15,000 plants or, or so. And wouldn't it be better to invest in other renewable sources uh, rather than nuclear? And in this sense, I'm gonna be a bit provocative, uh, but do we need nuclear energy at all? Because I mean, nuclear waste is also an issue since it stays radioactive for thousands of years. So that's basically my question. Well, it's interesting, your, your question. Uh, um, of course, there is a uh, uh, criticism about the disposal of uh, spent fuel, but uh, the demonstration of the technology for, for uh, doing this is uh, made by the leaders of this in this field and uh, we think there is no problem the problem is not so not is uh, the cost the, the, the main problem for doing this is uh, the politics and uh, people's opinion but um, we don't see any problem from the point of view of technical capabilities uh, talking about the uh, costs of producing nuclear energy, similar to other mean forms of uh, producing electricity. Uh, the thing uh, for nuclear energy is the, the investment is much larger than the other options. Uh, but uh, at, at, at the end, the cost for, for megawatt is uh, the same for other uh, uh, means of production, producing electricity. That's that's the my point of view. If I can make one quick statement, <laughs> push back a little bit. The, the the cost of the reactors, though, is what's what's so high. So you're right about the the cost per you know megawatt or whatever you want to want to call it. Um, that's commensurate, but the, the the actual cost of the reactors, all the issues related to the waste, um, all the environmental issues, um, is going to be higher for reactors than it is for uh, other types. And that's why there's so much interest, I think, these days in wind energy. Although I do buy your point about the fact that you need to store the energy, but even then, there's a lot of progress that's being made in terms of storage uh, in, in, in different types of batteries and, and, and so on. So, so um, I, you know, you, you can see this from two, two different uh, points of view. And then there's also the safety issue related to reactors, which is another, uh, another, another point. That if you have an accident, then the accident can be very severe and have a very dramatic impact. That would not necessarily be the case in the case of a I don't know, uh, in, in other types of uh, energy sources that, that would have such a terribly dramatic impact. So I think there's other ways of looking at it. If you don't mind, just push back, push, push back. pushing back just a tiny bit. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Ferenc and Gustavo for excellent presentations and for your um, thoughtful answers to a number of good questions. I think we, uh, set up the course very well that everyone has a good understanding now of how our uh, fuel cell cycle operates, the role of nuclear energy and the dangers involved with that, as well, of course, as the threat of, of nuclear weapons. Um, uh, and for instance, thank you very much for also contextualizing it with your pictures. I always appreciate that you use that. It, it puts it into perspective that these are not uh, simply um, scientific um, instruments, but the instruments of death. So, uh